Uh, thanks for everyone being here again. Great to see you all. Let's uh, fire away. Andy, what's the, what's the biggest advantage or difference for, for a, a quarterback, in, in this case Jason, but, but a quarterback, knowing from day one of a week that it's, that it's his week and, and he's going to be out there? Um, you know, I think one of the best things that we've been able to do with, you know, a lot of our personnel is when you're multiple and we've had plenty of snaps where, uh, you know, we're using two quarterbacks in the field at the same time, right? And so guys stay engaged. They have to stay engaged because you know, their opportunity to come, however it's going to look. So um, anytime that you have players engaged in whatever, however small or big of a role it is, I think it locks guys in on what um, they're doing, what their assignments are, right? So when you know that you're going to, Go out there and be expected to perform. I, I think uh, everyone's, you know, coaches, players, their focus shifts and just changes a little bit more. You know, it's kind of like sometimes when, when I remember back when I played college football and you told you you're, you're redshirted. And this is back when there was no this four game stuff. It was like you're redshirted and that's the decisions are made and it's going to be that way for the rest of the year. Your, your mindset changes a little bit from when you're, you know, you're not that. So, um, I, I think uh, he's had a great week of preparation. He's doing a fantastic job. Have you uh, have you had to have conversations with him about protecting himself? No, no. we don't. Yeah, no, no. We will. You know, everything that we do is we do it for a reason. I'll go way back to you know ask questions about why we do things that we do. And when you think about you know knowing your players and their strengths and their weaknesses, and knowing the depth that you have and and, and what you're doing and why you're doing it. You're doing it because you're thinking big picture, long-term sustainability and all personnel improvements. It's fun to be out there in two and three tight end sets, but if you only have two and three tight ends that you're healthy enough to do that stuff for you, well, then you prepare all those things, and if one of them becomes unavailable, you can't do that stuff anymore, right? Same thing with you know, four receiver sets and three running back sets and all that kind of stuff. So you want to make sure that you have enough depth to sustain you know, the ebbs and flows of a season in terms of player availability. So. Um, you know, in terms of what we would do and what we'd ask him to do is no different. We've got to play to win every game. Every game matters. And, and the guys behind him now, uh, Vasco, for instance, I mean, what's their week look like? You know, the same. Same it preparation, is. right? You know what I mean? Getting reps, uh, managing, um, you know, the expectations, I think. The standard is the standard. We say that around here, right? And so um, you need to train yourself, prepare yourself to be the standard in everything that you're doing. So that regardless of how much or how little you're playing, that you don't have to change what you're doing. And he does; he's done doing a fantastic job. He's always been locked in uh, as a freshman. He's been fantastic. Ethan has. Lance and JD both raved about Ethan all preseason. I guess for you, since he stepped on campus to now, I guess where have you seen him kind of grow the most? Well, his understanding and ability to command, you know, uh, what we're doing offensively is impressive as a freshman. Um, those that, that characteristic, and, I, and I've said these things about, you know, Jalen before, the, that charisma, that, that confidence. Um, that's not arrogant, though, right? If that makes you know, if my, if you know, you know what I'm saying, I think everyone understands somebody that's confident, not arrogant. Those are two different things. Uh, he, and Ethan certainly has a sense of confidence about him, that, that what we're doing, that is, you know, kind of inherent to him, right? However he developed, growing it up, probably family, stuff like that. Um, for him to be able to come in and handle those things and get those reps and see him develop from when he first got here in the summer now, it's great. You know, so that would, I would I'd point to that. In, in terms of the skill sets between Jason and Jalen, obviously they're different players. I guess what are some things that you like about Jason that maybe Jalen can't do? Well, we said all along, I mean, Jason's got some elite speed now. I mean, real deal elite speed. So uh, you have to use that, right? And utilize the, the you know his, his capabil uh, capabilities. To, to, to handle that stuff. So, but you know, in the sense of making comparisons to players and what one can do and what can't do and stuff like that, it's, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. Um, again, I'll just go back and say, you know, what I said right away is the reason that we do what we're doing is because we have him, right? We have the, what we have at the quarterback position. So that's why we do it, you know? Andy, what have you seen from Oklahoma's defense? Uh, you know, well, the, there's a lot of athleticism over there, right? And, um, you know, they're very multiple schematically, very, very multiple schematically. They do a lot of things and try to do a lot of things to put stress on, a, on, a, on an offense um, from protections to run fits to coverages. Um, and it's kind of uh, fun to watch matchup because they try to do defensively, I think, what we try to do offensively. And that's try to create a lot of confusion and make people react to them. And um, that's who we want to be. We want to be the kind of team that makes people react to us and uh, go out there and 
do our game, right? Instead of trying to figure out all these other things that, okay, how are we gonna pick up this pressure? And this, you know, how's this coverage gonna be identified? And screw it, let's go. Let's go play football. Let's do what we do, right? And make them react to us. Um, but from a personnel standpoint, like I said, there's a lot of athleticism running around that football field for sure. And not to pinpoint or single out another person that had a lot of decent guys playing. You know, I think if you were to follow them, I think you would hear them talk about maybe some, some injuries and people coming in and out of the games. And, and so there, there, there's a decent amount of guys that are playing. Um, but, but you don't go out there and go, hey, there's a dude that you can really pick on. You know, you're not saying that right now. So um, that's what I'm seeing from them. On Coach, uh, in the hierarchy, in the job, offensive coordinator's job description, where does um, being able to prepare for and deal with um, uh, issues, yeah, injuries with your starting quarterback fit in the hierarchy of what makes a good offensive coordinator? I'm not 100% sure I know what you're asking. Um, I had not. I, I know that everything that we do and we discuss, we make sure that we're getting the same page as a program from the head coach down, right? right. You know, and the decisions that we're making. Um, a word that, you know, I think you hear Coach Leipold use a lot in our staff, we talk about the word alignment and making sure that everyone's on al in alignment with what uh, we're doing and why we're doing things in the program. I'm not, again, I'm not sure if I'm answering no, your question. Meant, uh, to be a good offensive coordinator, every offensive coordinator is going to deal with injuries to the quarterback yeah. situation. So being able to be prepared for that, you know, that's part of your job description. Yeah. That's part of every coordinator's job description, right? And, and an important one, um, considering it's the quarterback. So Correct. And, and so I think, so if I'm understanding it correctly, so I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that you, you, again, would look at the depth of your position. You would look at the capabilities of all the spots. Right. And again, the quarterback one is the one that everyone can focus on because it's the quarterback. But part of the reason we do what we do is because of our, the capabilities of our offensive line. Right. And let me tell you, same thing with the receivers and the tight ends and the running backs and the quarterbacks. So, so we, we took it all, though. We look at all those things as a, as a, you know, as a one, all pieces of the puzzle and make sure that you, you fit it together. And so that what you decide to do schematically, what you decide to call, what you decide to more importantly practice throughout spring and fall camp, you can feel good about okay, that should be good week one, this should be good week six, this should be good week 10 still. I know I've, I think I've commented in here before about how offensively you have to be prepared to evolve every week, right? So what happens week one to week six to week 12, there's things that occur throughout the season to the, to the point that you're making, perhaps it's an injury uh, to, to any player. Are you prepared to evolve with that injury and make a certain part of the offense bigger or smaller based off of what is available for you as an offense. So I think that you have to have some big picture, holistic thinking that's sustainable through from week one to week 12. Does that answer your question a little yes, more? Sir, yep. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and just in your experience, um, is this a unique or unusual situation having, um, being able to call on a second quarterback with as much experience and proven talent and leadership as you have with Jason? Well, going into the season, when we were talking about competition, um, you know, through spring and fall, I talked about how blessed we are that we have two quarterbacks that have played five, power five snaps. And that's still true. I mean, we're, we're, we're fortunate that we have the guys to be able to go in. Um, they have confidence that go in there and run the offense. And that, that is a blessing, you know. Um, that we're not going into the game with a different kind of call sheet, you know. Yeah. Right, yeah. it's it's the same thing, same offense, and, and the way that we practice and the way that we get reps and the pace that we practice allows us to uh, make sure that we feel really good about our evaluation and understanding a young man's capabilities and limitations. Right, you know, at all positions. Yeah. Um, so so it's not new per se, right? But uh, um, it's things that you always are mentally prepared for. Obviously, you've only been able to practice three days this week, but what's the reacclimation process look like for Trevor? this weekend going forward? Um, you know, just get right into it. You know, like full team activities, rock and roll, out there running around, playing receiver, having fun, you know, and fun to head back out there. What were your thoughts on Kai Thomas coming back from the injury last week and, and what can Savion Morrison do for the offense as well? Well, I'll tell you what, both those guys, I'm really proud that the way they've been able to kind of step up and um, and, and their role increases, right? And, and I always feel bad, and, I, and we, we talked in the first couple of weeks about how all these guys are playing and stat lines show certain things and you know and sometimes they don't and and now they have an opportunity to get a few more carries but both those guys allow us okay with dev and tory those four running backs allow us to continue to be multiple with that group and do a lot of the different things that we're asking them to do inside and outside the box um so 
but yeah, great to see Kai come back. You know what I mean? He's, I think him and Seve have had, honestly, probably their best week of practice in the three that we've seen so far since they've been here. You know what I mean? They, they, they're, they, 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 they're, they look fast. They're cutting well. Um, they, they've had a, they're having a really good week of practice, those two. When a team or a defense shows you something different in person than maybe what they put on tape, how important is the preparation that your team puts forth so that you're not shocked when you see it live? Okay, uh, that's a great question. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, I don't know that anybody can prepare for all the variables that occur on either side of the ball, any phase of the game. Somebody did at one point, and there's like millions of variables that you could have on either side of the ball based off 11 players and what they would be asked to do. So it goes back to fundamentally the foundation of how we train our guys and what we ask them to do. So first of all, do we have a good fundamental skill set for the mundane things in football? Blocking, tackling, running, catching, blah, 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 right? So how we go about our business in spring football and fall camp, that's why those are so critical because that's the, those are the major times that those are developed, okay? So then you inject the schematic part of it, which is kind of, I think, what you're asking about, right? How do all of a sudden we go out there? What happens if Oklahoma does something totally different on defense than anything they've shown on film? What I've always said to us as an offensive group is that when you get a team that changes who they are and changes what they fundamentally train themselves to be, who is that an advantage for it should be an advantage for the group that doesn't have to change. That's what I believe, because still fundamentally it's about blocking, it's still about tackling, it's still about doing all those sort of things. Uh, are there variances that occur that can cause you curveballs and things that you have to react to? Potentially, no doubt about it. But we want to make sure that, again, that we're staying ahead of the curve and we're being aggressive with our approach about how we are making sure people are reacting to us. I don't know if that makes sense to my answer, but I think uh, it's a good question. Andy, how long do you envision Jason stepping in for Jalen? Don't know, day to day. You know what I mean? It really is, day to day. And then for Luke, and you mentioned staff showing different things, but for Luke going to be your leading receiver right now, how does that live up to what you envision for him? You know, uh, on par. You know, like I said, um, I mean, I don't know when I said it, but uh, way back, I mean, I, I go, I think that group's going to surprise people because there's a lot of consistent individuals out there that are, that are going out there and we're going to line them up all over the damn field in a lot of different spots. And they're able to handle it mentally with their preparation and go out there and execute at a pretty high level. And so, you know, Luke was the leading receiver. Um, I don't, you know, in terms of rep counts and stuff like that, I couldn't even tell you who's out there the most. But, um, uh, I mean, I, I would have, I'm, I'm like, it doesn't, wouldn't surprise me. You know what I mean? But you could also said, what if LJ had the most catches? It wouldn't surprise me. What if Quinton had the most? It wouldn't surprise me. You know, right? What if your tight end had the most catches? It wouldn't surprise me. You know, because at the end of the day, you know, you can set certain things up to maybe have a guy who's a primary target or whatever, but I'll go way back to, you know, a few weeks ago, and, you know, you know, our quarterback's going through their progression so well and getting the backside of things because they're taking away the primary side. So you can't always control who gets the ball. Um, it's more about making sure that when your opportunity comes that you are catching. So opportunities have rose for Luke, and he's been able to capitalize on them. Obviously, there's a lot of talent in the running back room. And you just talked about it. For Sevion, it seems like when he's gotten on the field and gotten touches, he's – had some big plays for him. What does the pathway look like to getting more involvement while also knowing that right, Devin and Kai are both incredibly talented as well? That's a really good question. That's a question that even a lot of the players individually might ask. What do I have to do to get more? Mm -hmm. And the answer is the same for everybody. You have to consistently show it day to day. And Sevy's been doing that. It's been good. And so you can see week to week, just a little more, a little more, a little more, a little more. Right, and eventually, what you're doing, the right, the, what, what's the saying about the tide and whatever, all rising waters raise all the ships, or whatever the hell that is. You know what I'm saying, right? Okay. So when everyone gets better, right, don't quote me on that or try to find <laughs> it in this one. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Right. Ah, he said it all wrong. Okay. Anyway, uh, it, right, the rising tide, rising tide raises all ships. Is that what it is? Google that. Thank you. Okay. Right. So as uh, uh, you know what I mean. So as he improves and other guys improve, and next thing you know, we're all improving together. So the answer for any individual to get on the field more is to be able to consistently do it over and over again in practice. Nobody's going to step on that field unless they've shown the ability to do it in practice. And nobody. Right? I've said it before, and Coach Leipold said it, we don't want anyone in this program to start or play by default. Earn it. Everything that we're doing. And he's been doing a great job of it. And he's been, he has been improving. Fantastic. I'm working with the offensive line. Um, in terms of blitz pickup, you know, six weeks into the season, how do you think that group has handled that aspect? Well, well, you know what I mean? Um, 
you know, I don't know, you know, you break down like presser percentages and stuff like that. I think the most important thing, and we've talked about this before, and we've talked about third down success, is that you're staying out of long, predictable third and long situations where they have the open playbook and all those exotic pressures that we were talking about scheme-wise with the, some of the previous questions. Um, they can show up a little bit more. It's hard to want to do all those things when you have to all of a sudden fit some sort of option scheme. It's hard to want to do that because you can get gashed and they're gashed in a hurry. Uh, but when you know a team's got to drop back, that's when it gets a little more predictable and they're like, okay, let's dial this stuff up. So it'll be more about us, but they've been, they as a group, and I've said this, I think for a couple weeks in a row, they're doing a fantastic job of getting everyone on the same page. All five guys, the back and the quarterback, those, those guys and the tight ends when they're involved in protection. So that box is doing a fantastic job of being on, in alignment. And we say all the time, we say, it doesn't matter what we do, it just matters that we're on the same page. And those guys are doing it. They're doing a really good job of that up front. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Yep.